<clears throat> okay, so let's look at this. Thank goodness we are out of medical in the trauma. But uh, <clears throat> the big thing when we look at it is in your treatment, okay, on test, skill sheet, whatever, follow the skill sheet as always, okay? You'll notice a sort of a flow through it when we're doing our uh, assessments and they're going through these different traumatic injuries. They, will, they just follow the skill sheet all the way down, okay? And so we'll, we'll take a look at that later. The second thing is everything is rapid. It's trauma. There, we want to get, if we're on the scene, we want to get on the scene and off the scene. <clears throat> we'll look at this thing at the end of this chapter called the go, uh, sort of the golden hour. And part of our golden hour is 10 minutes. We want to be on the scene, off the scene within 10 minutes. Uh, if there's an extrication, then we need to document Hey, there was an extended extrication or extended circumstances while we were not off the scene in 10 minutes. Otherwise, we're outside the standard of care. The standard of care for trauma is 10 minutes on and off, okay? So, and always treat for shock. That's one of those things that we just do in trauma, and that way we don't get caught with our pants down. We, we treat for shock. The other thing that you'll notice that is, it's probably an old expression. Uh, the other thing that you notice is a commonality in, in the treatment, okay? We, we BSI, sing, si, BSI, sing safe, size up, right? We all do that. C, A, B, C's is cervical spine. The C in that cervical spine, part of your trauma assessment is that you have to instruct your partner to hold C spine. If you don't do that, you fail automatically. Okay, it's a critical criteria. <clears throat> then ABCs, there's a, a few parts of that. Is the airway open? We would use a jaw thrust to open the airway in a traumatic patient. And then evaluate the need for oxygen, right? So you go through that. Are they breathing? Are they breathing adequately? Uh, shallow, inadequate? Do we need a back valve mask? Do we need to breathe for them, right? And then circulation check that radial pulse if they're conscious unconscious carotid pulse correct and then bleeding is part of c so if they have some major bleeding we have to control the major bleeding before we move on okay so we would control that so if you walked up to the patient and blood was squirting out of his femoral artery then that would be part of c you would you would control that very quickly these cbacs only take a couple of seconds so uh, and you can do those little multitasking there put pressure on the femoral artery and then see if they're breathing okay two minutes or so bleeding out of the femoral artery and, uh, you don't you won't need to worry about patient care all right so anyway so they have, if they have a big bleed control that bleeding that's all part of that treat for shock protect the wound, place a dry sterile dressing on most of it. Sometimes it's a moist dressing if an organ's exposed. It's a moist sterile, sterile dressing, okay? But in some way you would protect the wound. Then if needed, you would splint. Splinting is a good way to control the bleeding. Learn that in another day. And whether that splint's a small splint, like a board splint, or a big splint, like a backboard, you would splint, okay? And then everything's rapid. rapid physical assessment, rapid exam, rapid transport. So that trauma is really easy because it's, it's, it's very cut and dry. It's not like medical where there's a bunch of different parts. Trauma is very easy in, in test land and in this land, in real land, okay? Trauma, it, uh, I, I, I mean, I love trauma, but it's, uh, it's the easier part of medicine. I'd rather do trauma all day long than one person having that MI. The MI is much harder to uh, work with than trauma. Okay. So, but these are critical steps sort of as you, as you go through it. Okay. Uh, in this chapter, this sort of gives an overview of, of what to look at in the kinetics of trauma. I think they used to call it T 
kinematics of trauma, where they study trauma. We still do that today. We study trauma. We study all these traumatic events and see how they happen, especially like childhood fatalities. We study that, try to try to see what the prevention is. And that's what, just what this sort of goes through here. Uses the Glasgow Coma Scale and all that, but uh, later introduced the uh, revised trauma score to you, where they uh, you have the Glasgow, and then you have the revised trauma score that uses blood pressure and respiratory rate. I think you always have to look at the chart. No, I'm joking, but it's the chart thing. So we'll look at that uh, at a later date. The other thing is. You know, we look, when we study the trauma, study this kinetic energy, the ones that's moving, we're moving, moving body, right? And then mass and velocity, velocity squared. Velocity is always bad. So you see these cars driving 100 miles an hour? If they were to hit something, they'd fly apart because velocity squared. You have two cars going 70 miles an hour that hit each other head on. That's a lot of lot of impact, okay? Uh, I haven't read the study, but I just heard it that, you know, and thank goodness, 70 miles an hour is, we, we need to drive 70, but back, way, way back when, they, they lowered the speed limit to like 55, and they said, well, it would save gas and lives, and it does because the velocity, okay, at a wreck at 55 versus 70, it doesn't seem like a lot of speed, but it's huge because we always take five over. So if the speed limit, like you know, Interstate 30 is 75, right? What do we drive? 80. 80. Everybody does five over, right? I'm gonna drive 80, I'm, not, I'm driving 80, right? 80 mile an hour wreck would be catastrophic, uh, depending on how it impacted. A, a wreck at 60, not, not so bad, depending. You know, there's a lot of depending factors, and that's what this sort of goes into, but velocity. Now can you imagine if you had mass to it? So now you have the big 18-wheeler, okay, that's driving 85, right, and hits a car or hits something. They have mass and velocity, so that would be uh, a fatality. You know, so the uh, things, that we, things that we look at there... We study what's called, and, and we talked about, I think, in trauma assessment, mechanism of injury, right, MOI. What's the little, what's the little cartoon? The helicopter one. <laughs> we need, that's funny. I've only seen it like 50 times. I still laugh. But we study the mechanism of injury because that's how we sort of predict what the patient could be injured, or what could be injured, or what could be taking place in the body. Right? Uh, it goes into all these laws of inertia and acceleration and deceleration. A lot of in injuries take place because deceleration, right? We don't fear the fall, what do we fear? If someone falls, we don't really fear falling, what do we fear? The sudden stop, <laughs> right? <laughs> The fall's not that scary. The sudden stop when we hit the ground is what we what we should be fearing, okay? Because that deceleration injury causes massive amounts of damage. When we look through here, we we'll look. We have uh, over here on 813, we have this guy hitting the steering wheel with his body. They named it body collision and organ collision. Well. He hits the steering wheel and the heart inside the mediastinum moves, it shifts, and now the heart comes in contact with the sternum on the inside. Remember, energy can't be destroyed, it can only be transferred, right? So now that energy is transferred into the body, now into the heart itself. These deceleration injuries are uh, quite remarkable when we see them. Let me get my heart and I'll show you. Okay, so the aortic arch, 
This little part right here is a ligament. I can't remember what it's called by any means, okay? It holds the arch up on the aortic arch. What ha and I've seen it a couple times, uh, and it's, it's always a fatality. Okay, so the, uh, what happens is shifts, deceleration injuries, they move forward and they shift, and of course not this drastic, but the heart moves, okay, in the mediastinum. Sometimes this ligament will transect the aorta. That's how long the patient lives. Yeah, uh, not even, they're gone, they're done. I mean, it's almost instantaneous, you know, uh, because all their blood volume now is down in there, sort of, it's just sinking down, it's following gravity. Their entire blood volume is now uh, either in their chest wall or somewhere, eventually it will make it down into the, not the, necessarily the abdomen, but the flanks and everything, it will pull down. So the, uh, there, you know this took place when there was minimum damage really to the patient. There was not a lot of external trauma, but they're like this color. And they're, they're white, and you know, you can just tell them, I mean, they're, they're like DRT. I mean, you can sort of tell they had that big deceleration injury and something, probably the aorta transected, something like that. So we have that in, in these deceleration. It's always the stop. People hitting something that's, especially people hitting something that's it's not moving, like a wall or a pillar on the interstate or something like that. They hit that and they decelerate really quick, okay? Now the cars are designed to help us, but they can only help us so much. Seat belts keep us inside the vehicle. They keep us from hopefully hitting the steering wheel, causing a secondary injury from the, you know, the, the initial accident is the, the hitting whatever patient hits, right? The secondary accident is the patient hitting something else like the steering wheel, okay, or the windshield. If they're not fastened, if they're not restrained, then they're gonna go flying into the windshield, okay? The term is, unless they go out the windshield, ejected from the vehicle, the term is starred. So you walk up and then you're good size up, you see this starring of the windshield where the head has hit the windshield, okay? Close head injury, okay? Almost all the time. Uh, sometimes the win windshield breaks and the patient is ejected. Uh, if they're not strapped in with their seat belt, sometimes they're thrown through a side window. I've heard of patients being sort of sucked out through the little windows before, okay? Because of the, of the force when you start turning, okay? rolling over, they're, they're thrown out through some of the smaller windows. Last time I checked was, and it wasn't that far long ago, uh, if the patient is ejected from the vehicle, they have a 75% chance of a fatality. The, uh, the same way with the left front to left front. You know what I'm talking about? Driving down a two-way road, and this person coming here, you're on its left side, you pass like this, okay? If they're over here and they hit left front to left front, there's a 75% chance of a fatality in that accident. Most left fronts to left fronts at highway speeds uh, that I've encountered that they're, both of them are fatalities. Okay, so the, uh, it's, it's big because of the fact that the amount of force that Im impacts, okay? That's why passing in a no passing lane and all that is really silly, right? So we look at that, we look at different ways, and as we study the trauma, as we study what's happening, then, then we pick up, it's like, oh yeah, this is an, a really increased mechanism of injury. So an ejection from a vehicle would be a very high mechanism of injury. A rollover would be a mechanism of injury hitting a stationary object that, that uh, at a high rate of speed would be a high mechanism. And I mean high rate, like highway speed, right? 60, 70 miles per hour. When you go up and you're doing your size up, you, you judge the impact, is it a frontal impact? I mean, the cars are designed 
to crumple, the airbags come out. The newer cars, the more expensive cars, have side airbags on them. Like the Beamers have airbags on the top, so if you roll over, you're like in a balloon, little balloon, right? I mean, they're, they're nice with all these airbags deployed. They, they keep you from striking parts of the car and leaving the car. That's the important part about the seat belt. You don't want to leave the vehicle like, well, that way, okay? Uh, chances of survival is not very high. You look at the lateral impacts, okay? And then you get to talking about things, other things that you have to sort of size up. Is there a death in the vehicle? Like is, is the passenger dead? Or is the driver dead and the passenger is alive? That's a very high mechanism of injury. Uh, the best trauma life support guidelines saying that that's a level one. You need to transport that patient to a level one facility, okay? Because that is huge when it comes to mechanisms. You're in the same, you're close in the, in the car, right? So you're in the same compartment and the person next to you died. I've seen it a lot. You know, this person, so we transported this patient uh, to a level one, just for observation. One was the car, the, I have pictures, but the car was destroyed. It, it, it looked like a bomb had went off in it. Left front to left front, I think it was. Anyway, uh, grandmother died in the car and her grandchild was sitting next to her and she didn't have a scratch on her. Her granny was all jacked up. <laughs> But the, uh, so we treated, even though there was physically, outwardly, nothing wrong with the, the small child, we still transported her to like Parkland or something because of the death in the other vehicle. I think we actually flew her to Parkland because it's a, such a high mechanism. Okay, unresponsive patient or altered mental status in, in the vehicle. Altered mental status is always bad. Unresponsiveness is always bad. Uh, you know, the reticular activating system, remember the RAS, is what keeps us conscious. So if that is damaged and the RAS is in the sort of the midbrain, then that's a big insult to the, to the brain. Any loss of consciousness is sort of a big deal. Okay, we have to look at that, make sure we take that patient where they can get their CT done. When we talk about intrusion, this says greater than 12 inches. What we mean is intrusion is how far you're sitting in the driver's. Let's say this is the, the driver's compartment here. And you had a lateral impact or what they call, refer to as a T-bone. And a lateral impact here, it's how far their vehicle comes in your driver's compartment. So 12 inch, inches of intrusion would be here. Okay, now picture it. I'm here, and now this this vehicle, rate of speed, right? Velocity is important. Has pushed me over here. What's here? It's going to stop me. Yeah, it must have a console or something. You know, the bench seats are gone. You know, so the the console's there. So now I'm forced. I'm pushed up against another hard mm -hmm. object. In here, it's a twisting or bending motion, one way or the other. Anyway, intrusion in the side, there's nothing really designed to stop that except the side airbag. A side airbag will deploy, right? Just like a frontal airbag, if, if you have those. They only come in the expensive cars, so I don't have them, you know? But the, uh, so intrusion here, you, that vehicle's in here and it keeps going. 12 inches is really not that much of intrusion, okay? Uh, I've seen patients on the other side of the, in the, where the passenger seat used to be. All right. So you, you're talking 24, 36 inches of intrusion. Okay. And so some of the energy is lost in the car or transferred in the car, right? But as it continues to intrude into your driver's or the patient's driver's compartment now it's 
and comes in contact with the patient, now that energy is transferred into the patient. Okay? So that's what we, we study when we look at that. We don't spend a lot of time out there. We don't do any measurements or anything like that. We just like the little cartoon. We go, ooh, look at that mechanism of injury. Because we just know it's high. Okay? They do study it. Uh, police sometimes takes take videos and they study it and uh, we just want to know how to uh, a lot of the study is not for blame but uh, prevention right and then we talked about ejection okay uh, it's never good to, to leave the vehicle through a window and I think that 25% chance of survivability is if you don't go through something if you go through a window or a windshield I think it's less. Okay. And most all the time, uh, I've only seen, I've seen a, some been ejected and they're up, shaking themselves off. Most of the time, it, it created a closed head injury, a, a bleed or something, or multiple fractures or something. So the ejections are bad. Now the uh, the new cars have some sort of data, uh, telemetry data in it that they can pull from the, the computer and tell the investigators some information. Uh, like an ambulance, they know exactly how fast you were going. If you ever have a wreck in an ambulance, they know how fast you were going. They don't have to measure your skids. Uh, the ambulances are equipped with, uh, in the computer, tells them exactly how fast you were going. Or if you take a really fast turn, it, it tells, it sends off a signal to dispatch telling them that they're, they're speeding or they just turned this, they made this unsafe turn. Uh, there's all kinds of electronic stuff in cars now that will help. Frontal impact, uh, airbags hopefully will deploy, hopefully you're, the patient is restrained, right? Uh, we don't want them hitting the steering wheel. That's why the airbag is there. They may still hit the steering wheel, but the airbag will significantly slow them down. Okay, uh, and you can just imagine car, steering wheel, windshield, right? Uh, the seat belt can actually do some damage, but it's worth wearing it. Okay, and then you could be thrown up underneath. Uh, the dash being tangled in the car because on a frontal impact the cars have crumpled zones that's why they look all crumpled up on an impact front impact uh, the three crumpled zones uh, and then the motor mounts break the motor is supposed to actually fall out of the car before the motor gets into the to the uh, driver's compartment so the, the last thing that should happen is the motor mounts break and the engine falls to the ground if everything's working right. Seat belts don't, I mean airbags, they deploy like at 15 miles per hour on a direct impact. So, you know, uh, are you one of those guys that when you're riding along or whatever, if you're the passenger in long trip, you put your feet up on the dashboard? Anybody do that? I do. You did? Or you do? Yeah, uh, Google's your friend. You can Google the pictures. I see. Yeah, I the airbag comes out about 200 miles per hour or so. Legs back here. So, uh, and not in a in a in a matter where you, you think you're stretching. <laughs> They're forced back at 200 miles an hour. They're probably going to break at the femurs, then the hips are going to break. Uh, so the it, usually causes multiple pelvic fractures and bilateral femur fractures. All right, so the, uh, and it doesn't take much for them to deploy. They don't do it a lot, but they can accidentally deploy as well without impact. A hard stop or something like that, they could accidentally deploy. And they hurt. You ever, you ever got hit by an airbag? Yeah, I have. I don't want to do it again. Yeah. I thought I broke my sternum. 
I put the, then I jack, I, I, I signed a refusal, but then I was jacking with the fire department. They said, you, you think you're okay? I'm like, yeah, but I could have a tampon on. Cardiac tampon on, but that hit my chest. I don't know. Anyway, they thought it was funny when they made me sign the refusal. But no, it's, you get it, cardiac? Yo, you don't know what tampon on is yet, do you? The blood fills the sack. It, it'll be funnier when we get through with this. <laughs> Everybody go, oh yeah, that, that tamponade joke. Yeah, all right, okay. Anyway, so we, we look at the front frontal collision and see what they hit, the dashboard. You could strike your face. You could have multiple facial fractures, which creates a lot of bleeding. Head injuries, open head injuries, scalp injuries, facial fractures create massive amounts of bleeding. Uh, so that airway obstruction, when we start looking at that, and then we don't know if we're gonna turn or are we gonna stay stationary. So turning here, like the good, the good follow through in the golf swing, you're turning, okay? Uh, spinal, your spinal column twist, your, all your muscles pull, it's not natural. Okay, so that, that could happen as well. The rear impact, you get hit from the rear, and most of the time, they, those are surprising, right? You think about it and you think, you look in the mirror and go, oh no, then boom, right? So you, it pushes you forward and then back, sort of a whiplash, a whipping effect. It's very uh, common for C-spine injuries, upper spinal cord injuries. Uh, then the, uh, the large rollover. I've seen a lot of rollovers where the patients were absolutely, I mean, they crawled out of their vehicles, they dusted themselves off, they're looking at their car going, wow, and no injuries whatsoever. It's because they were restrained, okay? They stayed in the car, may have a couple small bruises and, and, and cuts, but they stayed in the car. And that, that's the big deal. And, the, and their speed was not really excessive. Even at highway speeds, I mean, 70 miles an hour. Uh, I've seen a lot of people just in rollovers, they get out and there's, there's nothing. There's nothing wrong with them, okay? Uh, others, it's, maybe they're not as restrained, they're restrained improperly, uh, or they just continue to roll over, like over here, right? So they roll over, and the more rolls that you do build up the amount of energy that's inside the vehicle, and then they start getting sort of thrown around like a ping pong ball. I mean, they're restrained, but they're still being tossed around, right? Now there's one that's not in here. It is sort of a rollover. It's called an endo. A rollover goes side to side, okay? An endo goes front end to rear end, and they start doing that. What's really cool is they start rolling and then they get square again and they do an endo, okay? Uh, really high mechanism of injury. Rollovers and endos. Now, the, uh, you know this, the number of rolls because of the witnesses. You try to get that information. How many times did they roll over? You can tell they rolled over because the, the roof is crushed in. Right? There's damage to the roof. So how many times you're trying to get information? How many times did they roll over? Were they restrained? Were there's any loss of consciousness? What? You go through your assessment uh, algorithm and uh, very rapidly trying to figure this out. The biggest things on a trauma, like a rollover or something like that, uh, that I try to figure out really quick, can they move their arms and legs? And the, was there any loss of consciousness? because that changes the, the level of mechanism, okay? So we wanna, we wanna find that out pretty quick. They move their arms and legs, that means that their spinal cords, you know, it might be, I mean, it's probably not damaged, it could be, but it's not right now, right? Because they're moving their arms and legs, they're speaking to you, uh, and there's no loss of consciousness, so 
this is still sort of intact. Now the seat belts can cause problems, right? But uh, and sometimes they're internal. You have internal bleeding from the seat belt. But I'd much rather have the internal bleeding or the injury or the bruise from the seat belt than being tossed out of the car through the, through the windshield. So even though they do cause injuries, most of them are just bruising. Uh, if they're properly worn, but uh, it's, it's better than the alternative. Kids, children, they need to be restrained. They need to be restrained properly. Okay, I've seen a lot of childhood fatalities where the parents didn't restrain the child. The child was acting up, fussing. They gave in and let them run back and forth in the seat, had the wreck toss the child around that car like a, like a ping pong or threw him out a lot of times. They eject, the child was ejected. So the car seat, we sent, we seen this, well, I didn't see it, but we responded this one. The child was ejected, the seat belts broke somehow. I mean, it was a big, big time wreck. And the witnesses were saying that the child was in their car seat flying through the air. So you sort of see this kid hunted out of this car, right? In this, this car seat flying through the air, but the kid was unharmed. Wasn't anything really wrong with him. And they just stayed tied in that car seat and went for the ride, you know? <laughs> but not, not too bad. Uh, motorcycle wrecks are usually, if, well, they're not fatal, uh, they, they can be at, at high speeds, but I mean, I've seen a fatality wreck at a, a very low speed, it cut the guy's leg off, you know, but the, uh, he ended up dying, I mean, I used to ride motorcycles all the time, and uh, it's very safe, you just have to watch out for someone, the other people, and protect this, wear a helmet, okay? If this hits the ground, bad things are going to happen, okay? But the thing with the motorcycle is there's no protection to absorb the, any of the in, uh, energy. It's transferred directly into the patient, okay? A lot of motorcycle wrecks are due to inexperienced riders. They don't, they don't know how to ride a motorcycle. Uh, this one the guy, brand new motorcycle. I mean, bright, shiny dealer's tags, right? And he went around the curve to, I mean, that's the fun in motorcycles, riding motorcycles, going around the curve, right? Going around the curve. He went around and he hit a pothole. It threw him off the motorcycle. And he would have been okay, I think, if the Jeep on the, the oncoming traffic wouldn't have run him over. <laughs> so he was... He was laying in the road and the, another car ran him over. But we determined, we could tell what had happened and the, the motorcycle wasn't even hardly, it wasn't beat up too bad. I mean, everybody was sort of standing around going, oh, man, I wonder if they're gonna sell it. You know, I know, that's poor form. But the, uh, we determined, yeah, he hit that pothole, you could tell you can see the impact marks on there. If, the, uh, if, if they have the proper equipment on, the helmet mainly, pants, they don't need all the leather stuff, that, that helps, it adds a layer of protection. A lot of times these motorcycle riders are okay. I've had some serious motorcycle wrecks. One was would have been a fatality if it wouldn't have a helmet on. I was thrown over, hit a curb, the lanes, two lanes, and then they went to one lane without a sign, and uh, there was no signs, and it was dark, and didn't see the curb, and hit it like at 40 miles an hour. Uh, the person on the back goes, do you see that? And he, he pushed off the back, and I hit the curb, and it threw me over, and I landed on the uh, pavement head first, right here, on the frontal row. Mm -hmm. I had a big scrape here, and up my helmet. But, uh, I was just sore, but it would have killed me if I 
didn't have a helmet on. But other times, we see the accident coming, so you just lay the bike down. You know, and the injuries are not as bad then. So the, his motorcycle riders are always ride defensive. We're always looking, so we see Granny not, not stopping. So we either avoid, go around, or have to lay the bike down. So if you're trained in that and you know how to do that, then it's, it's not too bad after you get over the abrasions and stuff and the fact that your motorcycle scratched up. I had a guy over in me on a motorcycle and he said that it didn't have brakes. His motorcycle didn't? Yeah. He was, I saw him trying to stop it with his feet like going like that. And he was, he was oh my. He lost his brakes. That's, I'd laid it down before I hit you. I really, like, he hit me so hard, like, it screwed my car forward. I don't know how he wasn't, like, in my back windshield because the whole, like, front end of his motorcycle was, like, tucked up and under and, like, punched a hole through my car. Oh, my. Through my bumper. I'm surprised he didn't go. That's what I'm saying. Like, I don't know how he wasn't, like. Yeah. I would lay it down before I hit you. I don't know. Yeah, some weird ones. The, uh. <laughs> you know, sports bikes are designed to go 200 miles an hour, over 200 miles an hour, but not on Interstate 30, on the racetrack. They're really designed to go to 200. So, uh, but you see these guys going 200 miles an hour down Interstate 30 because they can. They hit a good-sized bug, and they're going to die. Any, any kind of rock or anything in the on the racetracks, there's no rocks or, or stuff, debris. You know, you hit a, you hit anything. I, I got the breath knocked out of me by a grasshopper. A grasshopper hit me in the chest and liked to knock me off the motorcycle. <laughs> yeah, I know. Stupid grasshopper. Then I had this big sort of guts all over my chest too. But anyway, uh, falls, feet first, head first. We have to look, fall feet first, you land on your feet. That sounds really good until you see that the energy is transferred in your feet into your spine, okay? Uh, what's it say, two or three times your height of a child? These are always, you know, we, we look at two or three times the height as being a significant mechanism of injury. Uh, 20 feet onto a... Uh, concrete or something like that, 20 feet into water, you hit the water incorrectly. It's, it's like concrete. But usually the gauge we go by is two or three times the, the height, okay? Uh, you know, you, you have to suspect spinal cord injuries, and we'll, we'll talk about that in another day. Uh, ATVs are always a big problem because nobody likes to wear helmets or any kind of protection on the ATV. The other thing with ATVs is Bubba likes to put little Bubba on the man-sized ATV and let, let little Bubba drive it around. And uh, it only takes one too much acceleration and the, the ATV pops up and little Bubba goes back that way. So uh, I transported four, well not me, I flew out two, but uh, kids, four kids on one ATV driving around they hit the acceleration too much and threw all four of them off the, off the back of the thing. No helmets, nothing. They were all, uh, two of them were critically injured. So, uh, anyhow, so you get these different things from the ATVs. They're just like any, you know, you don't want to take the fun out of these sports, outdoor sport things like motorcycles and uh, ATVs and scuba diving and all of that, right? You want to, you want to keep the fun in it, it's a recreation, but you want to do things safely. Part of your task as a provider is education, right? So the, uh, you want to provide an education, it's like, hey, that's just not going to do well if they have an accident, which is, it's, it's likely. Okay. When we look at different types of gunshot wounds and blast patterns and, and different things, uh, one thing we look at is 
mainly cavitation with a bullet. That's the other leg. Here I'm going with arms. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Baba. Okay. Here's what. Here's what the thing. Everybody, Chris, don't don't get distracted with with what Baba thinks. They think the bigger the gun. Oh, look at this big gun. Little bullet, doesn't matter what size little bullet, okay? Uh, flies out of the gun, enters the body, okay? What most bullets, especially self-defense bullets are do, uh, like the ones that you carry for self-defense, not the ones that you shoot in paper, okay? They cause massive amount of energy uh, transfer into the body. They, they expand out and they they cause massive amounts of damage, internal damage, okay? I mean, they're designed to, to kill, okay? What, all of them? Self-defense self, self bullets. I mean, they're, they're designed to kill the person, not, not wound them, okay? So this hollow point spans out and the energy is transferred into the patient. And as it goes through, it cavitates through. So it has this sort of open area so you, when it goes through the energy expands in sort of a V formation inside and it and it goes up like this so anything that's in the path like if the patient was shot in the abdomen anything in the path so the liver probably the spleen the stomach rupture of the hollow organs the, the just the, the bullet doesn't have to actually hit the liver the energy that is ex expended from the, the round will lacerate the liver. All right, so now you have really bad problems because you have all this internal damage from this cavitation. The, the, the bullet hole, the entrance hole, is, is small. The exit one, if it exits, it's going to be significantly bigger, okay? But it causes cavitation effect that you have to sort of look at and say, hey, what organs are in the location? Some bullets break apart, and then they cause multiple they fragments. They cause mul multiple fragments. So a bullet could break apart, and it could break off into the liver, lacerate the liver. A small round, like a uh, 223 or something, or a 22, they won't necessarily go through bone, but they do this thing called walking. So let's say they they hit in the sternum, that bullet will walk, it will flip, okay? And it may flip down and come out the leg, okay? So that bullet will travel. It will hit and sort of ricochet, but not really ricochet, it's called walking. It will just walk down the legs. It, it could hit and start moving over here the military developed the M16, which is a 223 round, okay? They used to have an M14, which is 7.62. It was a big bullet, okay? The M14 was a great gun. It was heavy, really heavy but to carry, but they uh, had a big bullet. An M14 round, or 7.62, is going to cause a fatality. Uh, they designed the M16 not to necessarily cause all these fatalities because if one person is wounded, it takes two people to carry them off. See the mentality of that? Now you've taken three people out of action with one, one bullet. But it's, it's just a, it's a faster round, but uh, not as much mass, but it has a lot more velocity. So those are the things you sort of have to look at you don't have to be all in guns to, to do it just you know you just learn over time hey this bullet like a, a 45 is a 
big chunk of lead. That's no, it has mass, okay, but it doesn't have the velocity, let's say, as a nine millimeter, which a nine millimeter is a small bullet in comparison, but it has a lot more velocity. Velocity kills. Velocity is where a lot of the problems are. Okay. Anyway, we'll look at that when we look at penetrating injuries. I mean, because they, they penetrate one part of the body, so you, on a gunshot wound, you have to look at the other part. Stabbing's the same way. You know, if I was to take my sword and stab you in the abdomen, okay, uh, when I pulled my sword out, there would be blood here, okay? So I would have to look, it's like, how deep did that go? You know, if the guy left his sword there, right? How deep did that go into the body? Which, which direction? You know, what could be affected? Because all you see is probably the entrance wound. So you don't, and so you have to sort of think about what's taking place inside so you can estimate the injuries, right? For, for transport in severity. Blast injuries, TV takes all these away, okay? Makes it, everybody think that blast injury is not bad, but a blast injury is that concuss, concussive force, okay? So you have the initial concussive force that hits the body, that energy is going to be transferred into the body, which can cause a lot of damage, and then it's going to move the patient so you have a secondary injury. So if the blast took place, blew me up against the wall, now I have, now I've hit the wall, and plus everything else around, all the, all the debris that, that can take place. Uh, most blasts like that, large explosions, uh, they don't get up and dust themselves off and start shooting each other again. Uh, blood out their ear, they can't hear, they're very disoriented. Uh, internal injuries, you always have to predict those, okay? So blast, and we have to look at the three different type of injuries, the initial blast, the debris, pretty easy. Uh, golden time, golden hours, our 10 minute time like we talked about. We have 10 minutes on and off scene. Uh, a lot of this involves air medical, if you want, a lot of trauma, uh, especially where I live, is air medical because we don't have a trauma facility. So we airlift the patient to a trauma facility. Uh, they, average helicopter flying 150 miles an hour, no stop lights, and direct path to the to the hospital. They don't have to follow the roads, right? So they can get there a lot quicker than on ground. And then uh, we'll, we'll go through a landing zone thing and we'll talk about the criteria and everything there. But we want to we keep that 10 minute time in, in mind for when we get on scene, 10 minutes later, we're gone. Okay. And then last is the different trauma facilities around here, level ones, okay? Level one is a teaching facility. So you have a, a trauma hospital. The, they have all the services all the time, okay? And their teaching hospital is what makes a level one trauma center. So they have thoracics, vascular, neuro, ortho, right, peds. They have all the all the all the services that somebody would need, okay? And they're teaching hospital twenty four seven. You have a level two which has the majority of the you know, the uh, help me out here. Shutting down services like uh, they may not have neuro, but they have thoracic. They have a thoracic and abdominal surgeon, or in, in ortho, they may have that. You know, uh, but a level two is not typically a teaching hospital, and they don't have all the services all the time. 
they may have all the services, but they call in the services. Okay, so the they may not have neuro, but they call in neuro. Neuro is like on a 20 minute phone call, right? So they have the ability to call these doctors in, they just don't have them there. And then a level three is just a community trauma center, a low level trauma center. They can still take care of a lot of trauma, they can give blood, they can uh, do ortho, they, they don't have neuro, they don't have vascular, they don't have thoracics, you know, all the big ones. Uh, peds needs to go to a trauma facility, a pediatric trauma facility all the time. Uh, so they, they have those, but just not, so most of the time the level three, if you get any sort of large injury, then you, you have to transfer that patient out. Or you transfer them to a trauma facility. You, you take them to level one or level two, okay? Uh, it is really against the standard of care to transport a trauma patient to the inappropriate facility. You're, you're delaying treatment, so you would be held accountable for that. Uh, so if you had a, a someone with a fracture and you transported them to a level three that didn't have ortho, then that would be your, your bad on that. Uh, you, you would need to know that uh, ahead of time. Our, our trauma, where I live, the, the, we had a level three, and we would have to always call them. Do, do you have ortho today? Do you have this? And they would say yay or nay, and that would be ortho and how. Then the level four is not, it's just those the smaller hospitals are level four. The only time that they would see trauma is if the patient was on the brink of death and they didn't have time to get them to a, a, a level one, then they would stop in a level four to stabilize the patient. That would be the only time. Multiple systems, right? You have a patient with a lot of, so they, uh, all multi-system trauma needs to go to a level one trauma center, so they have all the services to complete. All right, get off tissue next. At least the pictures are good. Nothing, no, no questions, am I good?